Welcome to Lofty Pursuits and Public Displays of Confection in Tallahassee, Florida, where we make hard candy. I'm a longtime Doctor Who fan, and I was excited because the new season is starting this weekend, and I thought I'd take advantage of this and revisit a design I've done before, Doctor Who's TARDIS. I was never happy with that first video. So as I pour the 310 degree sugar and boil out the food coloring to make the colors right, let me tell you a bit about my history with Doctor Who. In the early 80s, my family made a trip to England, and on the way back at the airport, I was out of reading materials, so I picked up a book from the airport randomly. It was a Doctor Who book written by Ian Martyr. It was a novelization of one of the episodes with Tom Baker in it, and I loved it. Then I got back to New York, and about a year later, I discovered Doctor Who on WOR, one of the few commercial TV stations to ever show Doctor Who. Now the citric acid is added to give the blackberry that little tang, and I'm going to cut it apart into its different colors so I can work with it. Coincidentally, I tuned in to see the episode I had the novel of, and I was convinced that they had adapted the novel into the TV show, not as they did the other way around. When I cut the candy off the cooling table, the insides are very, very hot, but where a touch the metal is cool enough to touch with my bare hands. If I had bare hands, I wear these rubber gloves to protect me, so I have removable skin if any hot sugar hits me. Eventually, by kneading it, the sugar averages out into a temperature with no cold spots, and I can't handle it without thick gloves anymore. My color palette is light blue, dark blue, and white. And I haven't produced a white, I've sort of produced an amber. And I've got to make it white by pulling it on the candy hook and trapping millions of air bubbles inside to reflect the light and to make the candy look white. The first Doctor Who convention I went to was in New York City. It had to be about 1983. John Pertwee and Elizabeth Sladen were the guests. And it was my first experience on having people around me that shared my interests. Mind you, this was a really big convention at the time. It might have had 250 people attending. A few years later, my family moves to Orlando, and the house we selected ended up being a great surprise because it was a few blocks away, a short walk, from a wonderful science fiction store called Enterprise 1701. It's still in business under the name Sci-Fi City. The owner of that shop was Frank Dowling. He was a great guy, and when I had no friends down there, he was very friendly to me and it meant a lot and he let me hang up a sign to start a Doctor Who fan club on a bulletin board he had in the store by the door. I found two fellow fans, Diane and Kathy, and we arranged to go to a science fiction convention in Tampa together. My design for the TARDIS starts with the window. We really have to simplify the design because of the final size of the image. And then I take some dark blue and some white candy and I make light blue, and that'll become the inner walls, the top, the bottom, and part of the light of the TARDIS. Of course, because the TARDIS is symmetrical along a central axis, I'm going to build one side of it very long, cut it in half, and I'll end up with both sides when I'm done. We arrive at the hotel for the convention. John Nathan Turner is there in the lobby checking in also. We say hi. He was the producer of Doctor Who, the newer episodes at that point. We end up going upstairs, and Diane gets ready for her costume contest. She wins it as usual. I think she dressed as Alpha Centauri at that contest. This would have been 1985, and I had just gotten a copy of the Doctor Who role-playing game from FASA. It had just been released, I hadn't even taken the saran wrap off, and everybody at the convention who was interested was looking at it. We stayed in the hotel. Not many people seemed to have, most were day-tripping to the convention. And much to our surprise, at about 6 a.m., Gary Downing, the partner of John Nathan Turner, banged on the door of everyone who was at the convention, woke us up, and brought us down for calisthenics. I guess he got a list of which rooms were rented under the convention rate to figure out who to wake up. At least I hope that's what he did. In any event, we went down to the swimming pool and about 25 guests and about 7 cast members of Doctor Who were forced in a very comical manner to exercise in the morning and eventually everybody went swimming. And that's when I made an interesting discovery, well, I guess a discovery for me and nobody else, that the actor that played Harry Sullivan was Ian Martyr, who wrote that first book. And there he was and we were talking and examining the Doctor Who role-playing game together. Now we add the light at the top of the TARDIS, and we're going to add some white padding to either side to support that light to try to keep it from twisting when we roll the candy later on. If you ever have a chance, please come by Tallahassee and visit us. Our store is open from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. most days. We serve breakfast in the morning and ice cream the rest of the day, as well as the candy and our great selection of toys. We make the candy right out front, that's why we call it Public Displays of Confection. And if you're lucky, you might even see us make the candy. We don't have an exact schedule for it. 
If you can't make it to the shop, you can always get our candy at www.pd.net. We ship it worldwide. Now we have to wrap our cooler design in our warm white candy and then wrap it in a warm blue wrap. And we are done with the big log of candy. All that's left to do is to take it down into individual rods for cutting. So on Saturday night of the convention, I'm up late. We're hanging out in the convention hall, although the convention's over and it's just an empty hall. Nicholas Courtney is sitting at a table on the side, drinking some sort of red wine, getting a little soused. And Ian Martyr and I are going through the rules of the Doctor Who role-playing game by FASA. I don't think he'd ever seen a role-playing game before, and being an author, he was fascinated in the concept of interactive fiction. And I guess that was only fair, because I'd never hung out with an author before, and I was finding it fascinating learning how authors looked at things. With the candy, it's time to cut off the unicorn dropping and put it aside, and then pull out rods from the log that we will later cut into individual pieces of candy. So up to us walks Richard Franklin. Richard Franklin played Captain Mike Yates in the original unit group back in the John Pertwee Doctor Who days. And he comes by and starts paying attention to the role-playing game and becomes fascinated with it also. And Ian Martyr, me, and Richard Franklin generate some characters. The two of them get characters that are based off the roles which they played on Doctor Who. And we end up uh, trying to play the role-playing game. And it becomes weird because I'm playing the role-playing game with two actors who played the characters they're playing in the role-playing game on TV. We didn't have a term like meta back then, but it would have been great if we did. Ian Martyr was sitting there looking at a cartoon of himself in the role-playing game docs that uh, he was not very flattered by. So as I cut the candy, I think back to when we returned from that convention, and we finally started that fan club. It's still around. It's called the Guardians of Gallifrey. You can find it online. And they still have that Alpha Centauri costume. I should make another Doctor Who candy. You know, I've got some great sweet potato flavoring. I wonder if I could make a Santaran. Thank you for watching. On May 13th at the store, we're going to be having a YouTube party. We got our plaque for 100,000 viewers. We're going to make some special candy to give out. And of course, subscribe to us here on YouTube, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or visit us in person.